Okay, so let us continue with the discussion. So, you know, basically, we are uh, studying zeros of analytic functions, and our aim is to begin with the the argument principle which is uh, essentially a corollary of the residue theorem and then uh, try to prove some of these uh, important theorems with the Roche's theorem, Hubitz's theorem, open mapping theorem and the inverse function theorem. So let me begin with the argument principle uh, so let me start here of course you can look at a proper proof of the argument pr principle in any uh, in any standard book on complex analysis but I quickly try to tell you how you get how you get it so basically you are looking at uh, uh, so you are basically having a uh, uh, you know a contour a simple closed contour here so uh, simple of course means that it is uh, it does not cross itself there are no self intersections and uh, um, the uh, uh, and when I say contour it is piecewise smooth okay. So the when you write a parameterization for this contour then uh, the the function uh, considered as a function uh, of the parameter it is continuous and the uh, and is differentiable with respect to the parameter and the derivative with respect to the parameter is also continuous okay and this should happen piecewise right. So that is what a simple closed contour is and <coughs> We are, we, we, are, we are looking at a function f of z uh, which is uh, uh, so you know I will call this domain as uh, the, the interior I will call it as d and I will call the counter as dou sub d. So the, the partial uh, dou or del uh, depending on what you are used to this dou d is always the uh, boundary of d and that is the bounding contour and f of z is assumed to be is, is uh, uh, analytic uh, in on uh, uh, do <coughs> on the on the union uh, d union to d except for uh, uh, isolated uh, poles in d okay uh, and of course uh, uh, f has no f has no zeros on the boundary and f of z has no zeros <coughs> on on the boundary okay so this is assume this is assumption so which means that you see there are there are uh, 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 so so there are poles they are isolated poles they are isolated singularities and uh, the fact that there are isolated poles uh, already means that <coughs> um, uh, already means that there are only finitely many of them okay uh, and so there are there are points z1 uh, z2 etc zn uh, which are uh, as z1 through zn are finitely many poles <coughs> poles of orders uh, well if you want um, n1 and so on uh, oops so let me use capital n1 okay n sub n okay respectively okay and uh, and of course you must understand that the fact that there are only <coughs> finitely many poles is uh, uh, is is a is a consequence of topology because you see you already assumed uh, uh, um, that there are only isolated poles and you know a function which has only isolated poles is called a meromorphic function that is the language that we use a meromorphic function is a function which the only singularity singularities that it has are isolated poles okay in the region where it is defined so <coughs> of course it is not defined at, uh, at the poles but uh, at the places where it has singularities they are they are supposed to be isolated poles 
okay such a function is called a meromorphic function so basically f of is f is a meromorphic function but on the boundary uh, it's analytic and is never zero on the boundary okay and uh, see there are that it has only isolated poles in this in this region uh, in this domain d um, follows from the fact that uh, it follows from a little bit of topology see because if there are this region d uh, along with the boundary becomes a compact set okay d along with the boundary becomes a compact set and uh, you know uh, since you are in euclidean space in a compact set if you have an infinite subset there will always be an accumulation point okay so uh, if the number of poles is uh, uh, is in the if the if the number of isolated poles is infinite okay then if you take this subset of poles that becomes an infinite subset and that being inside a compact set will certainly have a limit point okay and that limit point uh, certainly uh, will also be a pole okay it will certainly not be a point of analyticity and uh, uh, then you you end up with uh, uh, I mean you you will get a contradiction to uh, the fact that uh, all this that, that limit point will also be a singularity and you will get a contradiction to the fact that all the singularities are isolated because in every neighborhood of that point you will have a singularity so it is not isolated you will get a non isolated singularity okay you assume that there are only isolated singularities and they are poles then uh, because of compactness <coughs> there are going to be only finitely many poles and as so the, so these are the poles and maybe maybe it is a good idea to use uh, let me use p1 uh, to pn to be the poles okay so uh, so let me use p1 to p1 pn and then of course similarly there are only finitely many zeros okay the reason is because i have already told you the zeros of an analytic function are also isolated okay the zeros of an analytic function are isolated this is a i mean this is a result of uh, uh, this that you should have come across in a first course in complex analysis and what is the reason the uh, the reason is actually the identity theorem if you want okay uh, see if you have a if you have a if you have a zero that's not isolated okay it means that in any every neighborhood of the zero you can find another zero so you can find a sequence of zeros which go to 0 okay and therefore what happens is that your function is 0 on a set which has an accumulation point and the identity theorem will then tell you that the function has to be identically 0 okay if a power and uh, that again also is true if you look at a power series if you have a power series and if it vanishes uh, uh, at a point and it vanishes uh, at a point in every neighborhood of that point that means you have a sequence of points where it vanishes and finally tends to a point uh, the sequence tends to a point where also it vanishes then the power series has to be complete to the zero series all the coefficients will vanish okay so the only way in which you can have a non isolated zero is that it's zero everywhere okay for an analytic function in other words if you have zeros they have to be isolated so the set of zeros will also form an uh, will also be isolated and again the same compactness argument will tell you that there are only finitely many zeros inside okay so call those zeros by as uh, say z1 z2 etc z sub m okay so z1 through z m are the finitely many zeros uh, of orders uh, L uh, well, okay, L one, etc. L M, okay, uh, and of course there are no zeros on the boundary. On the boundary, the function is analytic. Okay, there are there are no singularities on the boundary. But I'm further assuming that there are no zeros on the boundary. Okay, the, all the zeros are only inside. And there are only finitely many. Okay, and of course when you take a zero or a pole, you have to count it with multiplicity. Okay, you have to worry about the order of the zero or the order of the pole, right? and well <coughs> see the point is uh, uh, you know if you are if you are looking at a let us let us assume that you are looking at a simple 0 or a pole I mean uh, you are looking at a single 0 or a pole okay. So suppose I have a point uh, let me call just call it as uh, z0 okay and 
uh, and I surround it because it is isolated from the other zeros or poles suppose I surround it by a very small uh, uh, disc uh, 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 whose border is a whose, whose boundary is a circle okay and again I can uh, uh, parameterize the circle as <coughs> uh, I mean if I take the radius to be rho uh, small enough radius then there is no other uh, 0 or pole here okay and uhhh then the function f of z can be written as uh, z minus z0 to the power of n uh, let me use something uh, m if you want into g of z okay where uh, g of uh, z is is analytic at z0 at z0 and g of z0 is not 0 of course if m is uh, uh, m is either positive or negative okay m is positive if z0 is a 0 okay and m is uh, negative if z0 is a pole all right uh, if m is positive then m is the order of the 0 at z0 if m is negative then minus m is the order of the pole at z0 okay and now you know if you calculate uh, d log fz okay what you will get is you will get I mean this is essentially by definition is f dash of z by f of z this is the logarithmic derivative all right and if you calculate it what you will get is well if you differentiate this with respect to z you use product rule what you will get is m into z minus z0 to the m minus 1 uh, times g plus z minus z0 to the m g dash of z divided by uhhh f dash uhhh by 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 f which is just z minus z0 to the power of m g z this is what you get okay and if you if you expand it out uh, then what you will get is as follows you will get well and that will turn out to be so d log fz will be uh, so you know when I say this uh, I am I'm, I'm worried about f only in this small neighbourhood of z0 where I have chosen the radius rho very small and where there are no other zeros or poles okay z0 is the only zero or pole okay and there, there's not there's no zero or pole even on the boundary okay so I'm taking such a small uh, neighbourhood such a small disk and that's possible because all the zeros and poles they are all isolated okay they, they can be separated from each other by small disks okay uh, so d log fz will turn out to be well if I calculate this I will get <coughs> well I will get m by z minus z0 plus uh, you know here I am going to get uh, uh, an analytic function see what you must understand is uh, see g <coughs> uh, see the function g cannot uh, uh, see the function g cannot vanish anywhere here because if the function g vanish at a certain point that will also be a 0 for f okay but I have assumed f has no other zeros or poles. So in principle g does not vanish at the uh, g does not vanish and uh, uh, at, at z0 and it is analytic so this piece so the second term is uh, g dash by g okay and g dash by g uh, g not vanishing at z0 okay is an analytic function okay because you know if, a, if an analytic function does not vanish at a point then 1 by that analytic function is also analytic function at in a small neighbourhood of the point okay. So if you want you can shrink further the neighbourhood if you really want okay. So the fact is that the second term will be g dash by uh, g dash by g that is a that is a logarithmic derivative of g and that is analytic okay. And now you know if I if I integrate 1 by 2 pi i integral over gamma uh, okay yeah integral over this gamma of d log fz if I do it you know I am going to integrate this and you know if I integrate this part that is the integral we have already calculated you will get m which is the residue so you will get m plus if you integrate this part you will get 0 because it is Cauchy's theorem Cauchy's theorem says that if you integrate an analytic function you are going to get 0 or close curve simply close curve so the net effect is that you get m so you what you see is that if you do if you take a small enough 
circle surrounding a 0 or a pole and you compute the integral 1 by 2 pi i of the uh, of the logarithmic derivative you end up getting exactly the order of the 0 or the pole and now all you have to do is simply surround each of the zeros and each of the ports by such small disks okay and then use the Cauchy theorem in the region that is gotten by taking away from D these disks where the function f is completely analytic and the Cauchy theorem will tell you that the integral over the boundary is some of the integrals over each uh, each of these small disks but the integrals of e over each of these small disks gives you the number of uh, gives you the order of the pole or the zero and therefore you get the residue theorem namely you get you uh, so implies by Cauchy's theorem that uh, 1 by 2 pi i integral over the boundary d log f z actually will give you the number of uh, uh, you will get if, if, if there are zeros you will get all the li's so you will get sigma li minus and if it is a poles uh, you will get the minus ni's okay see mind you if <coughs> what you must understand is uh, 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 if this is a pole then m is negative okay and when I write n is an order of order, order of the pole p1 then this n1 will be this m will be minus n1 okay. So what you will get is sigma li minus sigma m uh, nj which is precisely number of zeros minus number of poles n sub 0 is number of zeros uh, n sub infinity is number of poles okay. So this is this is basically the argument principle okay it is an application of residue theorem plus Cauchy's theorem. So of course the question is why is it called the argument principle okay. So uh, the answer to that is that this quantity here is actually the change in the argument of f of z as z varies over this boundary okay. So why the reason why it is called the argument principle is the following you you normally write log a plus i b where a and b are real numbers okay i is of course always square root of minus 1 a square root of minus 1 you always naively write it as mod of a plus i b plus uh, i times argument of uh, uh, a plus i b uh, okay this is how you define the logarithm plus but of course this is not the <coughs> you know uh, uh, this is a multiple valued uh, thing in fact you can add to this argument you normally add you know plus 2 n pi okay and various values of n are supposed to give you the various logarithms uh, the only requirement is that a plus ib should not be the 0 complex number should not be should not be 0 okay I mean the problem is that when it is 0 the argument of 0 is not defined okay so modulus of 0 is of course defined the argument is not defined so it should not be 0 so you of course you get a uh, logarithm for every uh, non zero complex number and all these logarithms they all differ by uh, integral multiples of 2 n pi uh, I mean integral multiples of 2 pi i okay and uh, in the same naive way you can write well you can write log fz as you know log mod fz uh, oh I think I have forgotten uh, uh, there is a there is a lawn here which I have forgotten okay yeah I have forgotten this. <coughs> forgotten that so this is ln which is log natural log to the base c and this of course is also log to the base c for that matter only thing is that this is a complex logarithm that is a real logarithm to the both to the base c okay. So if you write log fz you will like you will get again naively you will get lo ln mod fz plus i times uh, argument of fz uh, plus 2n pi you can write something like this okay but then the there is a uh, this is okay if you fix a particular value of z okay but then the only problem is that you know uh, if you try to write this uniformly for all values of z in a domain then you might end up in trouble in the sense that you see the problem is that this log fz need not define an analytic function okay you what you will get is you will have to you will have to do 
uh, some kind of slitting of the domain uh, to uh, you have to throw away some points from the domain to get what is called a branch of this logarithm okay and the only case when uh, you will be able to get a uh, uh, I mean one case where you can always get a uh, uh, logarithm will be uh, uh, if your domain is simply connected and the function never vanishes on your domain you can always find a logarithm okay. Uh, uh, but but the point is that you know uh, uh, we we so you know you can you can naively write d log f z is d uh, ln <coughs> mod f z plus d if you want argument uh, of f z you can write like you can write it like this the where d is supposed to be uh, the difference as uh, you change z along an arc okay you you can change z along an arc and you can make sense of the difference in uh, in these values and of course here you choose uh, you choose a particular branch of the logarithm so what i'll do that i'd rather put a capital a uh, uh, and you should be able to choose a particular branch of the logarithm so in particular what i'm saying is that you can you can do this uh, on a nice arc for example you can do this on on this uh, on this boundary arc you can always do this on the boundary arc uh, you can write that and why you can do that is because on the boundary z can be written as a, a smooth function piecewise smooth function of a real parameter okay. So then you can so you know uh, uh, on on uh, uh, dou d uh, uh, if it is uh, which is parameterized which is parameterized by uh, uh, gamma of t all right where t is a uh, t v is in an interval on the real line okay uh, gamma piece wise uh, smooth which means that you know uh, gamma is uh, uh, continuous it is differentiable with respect to t continuous with respect to t differentiable with respect to t and the derivative with respect to t is also continuous piecewise that is what piecewise smooth means okay. So gamma is piecewise smooth with respect to t okay what you can do is you can write uh, you can write integral over dou d uh, d log f z as integral uh, from a to b if you want integral over gamma of uh, uh, d log f of gamma of t and that will be uh, integral over gamma of d ln mod f of gamma of t plus integral over gamma d argument of uh, <coughs> f of gamma of t okay where of course here you can choose a particular uh, single valued branch of the of the logarithm and uh, actually what will happen is uh, so you know what I am just trying to compute what this what what this integral is what is the logarithmic integral over a simple close contour like this if you compute it what will happen is see this part will be 0 okay the uh, uh, this part of the integral will vanish okay and this part of the integral will give you the difference in the argument of the function from the starting point to the ending point of course you know when we when we do this integration over the on the over the contour when you parameterize it then you know you choose some point which you take as gamma of a and that is also equal to gamma of b gamma is the parameterization of the path and the parameterization is a map so you think of parameterization as a map a b is the is uh, the interval on the open line i mean on the on the on r1 and gamma is 
a function and of course gamma uh, of t has a real part has an imaginary part and for different values of t you are going to get different points you are going to get different complex numbers and as t changes from a to b gamma traces this path and the starting point is equal to the ending point so gamma of a is the same as gamma of b okay and the fact is that if you if you go around once like this the first integral will vanish <coughs> okay and uh, the the second integral will essentially give you the change in the argument of f of z as you move across uh, the uh, across gamma so what you will get is see this this will turn out to be just f of <coughs> uh, uh, argument change in the argument of f change in the argument of f of z uh, as uh, you <coughs> go around once once along uh, along the boundary dou d which is now parameterized by gamma okay there is a change in the argument. So the fact is that if you calculate this uh, you know this uh, uh, logarithmic integral you are actually getting the change in the argument okay you are getting the change in the argument of uh, the of the function alright and mind you in all these calculations I had taken ARG to be a fixed determination a fixed branch of the logarithm if I had taken a different branch of the logarithm you know any two different branches of the logarithm will differ by a constant uh, uh, multiple of 2 pi i but since you are taking the difference this value will not depend on which branch of logarithm you took okay instead of taking arg which is one branch suppose I had taken arg prime which is some other branch okay then arg and arg prime will differ by say some 2 m pi but when you take the difference the 2 m pi will cancel out. So this quantity <coughs> which is a change in the argument that is that is not going to change okay. So I mean roughly uh, uh, what you must think is that what you must try to understand is that I when you calculate this logarithmic integral over the boundary you are actually getting the change in the argument of the function okay and the change in the argument of the function uh, could be 0 or it could be something it all depends on what the function is and it it depends very much on the on uh, the uh, zeros and the uh, poles of the function inside that is what the residue theorem says what the residue theorem actually says is that it says that you see the change in the argument of the function is 2 pi times the difference between the number of zeros and number of poles counted with multiplicity so this is another way of uh, uh, looking at the uh, the argument principle and this is what lends the argument principle its name okay so when you calculate the when you calculate the logarithmic integral I mean you calculate the integral of the logarithmic derivative over a closed curve what you actually get is a change in the argument and the argument principle says that this change in the argument is 2 pi times the number of zeros minus the number of poles inside okay that is why it is called the argument principle now the advantage of that is that we can now prove Roche's theorem so so here is Roche's theorem so so, so let f of z uh, and so let me use l of z and and b of z <coughs> be analytic functions on d union to d where you think of uh, this kind of a diagram okay so d is simple closed contour which is uh, piece by uh, and uh, I mean dou d is a simple closed contour which is piece by smooth and d is the interior and you take this whole region <coughs> along with the boundary and it is analytic there okay the two the both functions are analytic there and with uh, mod l of z <coughs> strictly less than mod b of z 
in uh, on on the boundary okay so you know the small end uh, the small l and small b are supposed to you must think of small l as little and small b is big and i am just saying that the bigger one is really bigger than the little one okay in modulus on the boundary okay then what roche's theorem says is that uh, then uh, uh, the number of zeros of uh, b of z and <coughs> b of z plus l of z inside d are the same okay this is Roche's theorem. So, so, so you just see uh, what it says it says see I have a function b of z which you think of as a bigger function it is bigger than l of z which is a smaller function and what do you mean by bigger in modulus it is strictly greater than uh, the modulus of l of z on the boundary okay then by adding to b z this little function l z you are not going to change the number of zeros inside you are not going to change the number of zeros inside and so this addition of this little this this l z to that b z is thought of a small analytic perturbation okay you can think of it as a small analytic perturbation and Roche's theorem is says that if you take the function analytic function b z and analytically perturb it the resulting analytic function is not going to have different number of zeros than the original analytic function okay. So, this number of zeros <coughs> the count of the number of zeros is not going to change. So, you know the proof of this is, is basically uh, an application of the argument principle. So, so let me explain uh, I mean let me first explain what is the idea of the proof the idea of the proof is here are two functions okay you want to show that they have the same number of zeros inside your domain alright which is bounded by this simple closed curve. Now of course mind you there are no poles okay there are no poles here the functions are completely analytic and uh, of course uh, uh, mind you the function b is has no 0 on the boundary b has no 0 on the boundary because you see on the boundary mod bz is strictly greater than mod lz and mod lz is certainly greater than or equal to 0 so that will tell you that mod b is at strictly greater than 0 on the boundary so b has no zeros on the boundary mind you b has no zeros on the boundary all right now i want to show that b of z and b of z plus l of z have the same number of zeros that's what i want to show how do i show it how do i use the argument principle the argument principle says that the number of zeros times 2 pi is the uh, integral of the logarithmic derivative and that is also equal to the change in the argument of the function. So, if I want to show that these two have the same number of zeros inside all I have to show is that the change in the argument for both is the same because it is the change in the argument that counts the number of zeros. So, all I have to show is that change in the argument of this and the change in the argument of that over this boundary is the same okay. So, in other words I have to show that the d arg of b z and the d arg of uh, <coughs> uh, change in the argument of b z plus l z they are the same as you traverse as z traverses along the along the boundary curve okay. So, that leads you to look at this function if you look at uh, b z plus l z by b z okay uh, you will see that of course you know uh, this is this is 1 plus l of z by b z okay and uh, so you know what this will tell you is that argument of you know the argument of a quotient is the difference of the arguments. So, you will get argument of b z plus l z minus argument of b z is argument of 1 plus l z by b z okay this is what you will get and therefore what this will tell you is that you know uh, so now I now I want you to look at this quantity here. So, so this equation will tell you that the change in the argument of b z plus l z 
minus the change in the argument of bz is equal to the change in the argument of this quantity and mind you I can divide by b because b does not have any zeros <coughs> okay and it does not have any zeros on the boundary so mind you all this is I am writing this down only on the boundary because I have to compute the argument change as z varies on the boundary b may have zeros inside that is not the point the point is this is being done on the boundary so 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 I should write this on on 2d it does not make sense if you take z, z, z inside because z, uh, z could be a 0 of b and then I cannot divide by b of z okay so this is happening on the boundary where b does not vanish okay so so this will tell you that d arg the change in the argument of d z plus l z minus the change in the argument of b z is equal to the change in the argument of 1 plus l of z by b of z this is what it says but the fact is that this is 0 see so the reason is you see you see what you should understand is uhhh mod l z is strictly less than mod b z on the boundary okay so mod l z by b z uh, is strictly less than 1 <coughs> okay and therefore uh, if you look at this quantity this quantity will lie only on the right half plane 1 plus 1 plus l z by b z lies in the right half plane right uh, I think that is <coughs> uh, I mean so you see this is a complex number uh, l z by z b z is a complex number that lies in the unit disc alright and to that you are adding 1 that means you are translating it to the right by 1 unit okay and therefore it has to go to the right of the y axis the imaginary axis so this lies in the right half plane so you know basically uh, so you know uh, uh, so so this means see for a uh, now the the point is that if you look at the argument of this uh, you see the uh, you see if you have uh, you know if you have a variable point uh, let me call it as omega which is which is which is say moving okay suppose it moves uh, from omega naught to let us say omega 1 okay then uh, you see the uh, if omega 1 and omega naught are the same and and you are looking at the right half uh, plane okay if it is on the same half plane then the change in the argument will be 0 okay so so essentially what it means is you see if you go from here to here the change in argument uh, will be literally you know this angle minus this angle and um, it will be the, the, this total angle all right but if you no matter how uh, uh, haphazardly you go okay but if you come back to the same point okay then your change in argument will be zero all right so what this tells you is that this is 0 the change in the argument is 0 and that will tell you that the change in the argument of b plus l is the same as the change in the argument of b as you go along the boundary but then the argument principle will therefore tell you that the number of zeros of b plus l is the same as the number of zeros of b inside the region bounded by the boundary that is the argument principle because the argument principle actually tells you that the uh, the the number of zeros is controlled by the change in the argument so to show the two functions have the same number of zeros all you have to show is the chain the arguments are the same for both, both functions okay so so this implies that by argument principle uh, see see the whole point is you know why i am saying one half plane it's because you know it should not happen that the, the curve should not go around and come back if it goes around and come back it will pick up a change in argument 
for example you know if it, if it went around across the origin and came back then it would, then it picks up see the moment it because the argument is measured with respect to the origin right by joining the point to the origin. So if you go around the origin certainly you are going to the argument is going to change by uh, by some quantity but if you are on the same side of the origin on the same side of a plane of a half plane passing through the origin the argument uh, is is going to be independent is only going to depend on the initial point and the final point no matter how you move so long as you are in the same half plane okay. So that is the whole point that is why I need that it lies in the right half plane okay I mean I know for sure that it is not going to wander somewhere here and then you know come out like back come back all the way to this because if it did that I will pick up a 2 pi and if it does that twice I will pick up 4 pi and if it does that in a different direction I will get minus 2 pi minus 4 pi and things like that such things do not happen because it never wanders outside this right half plane and that is that is that is the that is this condition that is because of that condition okay. So, so the argument principle uhhh b z and b d z plus l z have the same number of zeros. in D okay. So, this is an application of the argument principle that is that is Roshi's theorem. So, there is a uh, uh, you know there is a uh, another avatar of the Roshi theorem which you can <coughs> maybe try to prove as an exercise. Uh, so, let me rub this part of the board but then uhhh I mean this uh, what you must understand is that uh, this this theorem is pretty powerful the proof is <coughs> the proof is pretty easy okay because you have used uh, basically you have used residue theorem and uh, you have used Cauchy's theorem and so you have used uh, literally all all the all the uh, all the results that you have done in a first course in complex analysis all right. So, it is a very powerful theorem and to illustrate how powerful it is it is very easy to deduce fundamental theorem of algebra from this okay so uh, uh, but 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 before that let me give you uh, 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 a, str a stronger version of Roshi's theorem like f of z and g of z be analytic on d union to d and let mod of f of z plus g z be strictly less than mod f of z plus mod g z on the boundary then f and g have the same number of zeros okay this is another version of course you know mod of f plus g will always be less than or equal to mod f plus mod g but on the boundary if it is strictly less than that is the condition that tell you that will tell you that f and g will have the same number of zeros inside. So, this this other version of Roche's theorem is uh, I have written it is a stronger version but probably it is actually an equivalent version and uh, you can easily deduce it is an exercise to prove that uh, again essentially using argument principle and uh, this can be deduced from that that is uh, you you can as an exercise also deduce this from that and I think you can also do it the other way because essentially it is going to depend only on uh, argument principle okay. So, what this tells you is that if you want to say that the number of uh, zeros of two analytic functions is the same all you need to check is that the triangle inequality becomes a strict inequality on the on the boundary that is what it says okay. So, yeah so you, you can try that then of course let me give uh, 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 an example as to how powerful Rauch's theorem is. So, you can get uh, can get a fundamental theorem of algebra uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra is the theorem that you take a polynomial uh, in one complex variable with complex coefficients 
then all the zeros of the polynomial uh, uh, you can find all the zeros and they are they are they are going to be complex numbers okay that is that is precisely the fundamental theorem of algebra so i mean uh, the <coughs> the reason why this is called a fundamental theorem of algebra is because see in algebra uh, what you do is that you try to extend number systems because you are trying to solve equations so you know uh, uh, for people who have done courses in algebra you know that you know you, you can you start with the natural numbers and then you you extend them to integers okay uh, and uh, then you extend them to rational numbers and then to real numbers and then to complex numbers uh, and the point is that every time you extend it because you are not able to solve equations okay. So uh, ye from natural numbers to the counting numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 to the integers you, you extend because for example if you take the equation x plus 1 equal to 1 the solution is x equal to 0 which is not here so you have to include 0 and if you take an equation like x plus 2 equal to 1 the solution is minus 1 so you uh, need to have negatives so that is how you come to the integers and then here again you do not get so a solution for an equation such as 2x equal to 3 because the solution is x is 3 by 2 so you go to rational numbers you invert integers non zero integers and you get rational numbers and then these are all fields okay and then somehow uh, uh, you get uh, uh, you move the reason for moving from rational numbers to real numbers is actually to fill all the gaps which are the irrational numbers so it is more topological it is real numbers is a kind of topological completion of the of the rational numbers and then uh, and then uh, which for example in a first course in uh, analysis real analysis you would have seen is constructed uh, by the method of Dedekind cuts where you define real numbers to be equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers and the equivalence being two Cauchy sequences of rational numbers are considered equivalent if they uh, if you put them together as a even and odd subsequence of a bigger sequence then that sequence continues to be Cauchy okay and and then and then the point is that going from Q to R does not help because uh, an equation such like such as x squared plus 1 equal to 0 which is which will be the roots of uh, minus 1 cannot be solved here so you have to go to complex numbers adding i to the real number system gives you the complex number system okay and then the question is now uh, if you have an equation if you have a polynomial equation over complex numbers the question is are there going to be polynomial equations for which you do not have solutions I mean the question is do I have to further extend it to something bigger and the fundamental theorem of algebra says you do not have to do it what it says is that you know uh, you you now the uh, it, it says that the complex numbers are algebraically closed which is the fact that you take any polynomial uh, in one variable in one complex variable with complex coefficients then all the zeros are complex numbers okay so you do not have to go you do not have to extend the number system further so that is the fundamental theorem of algebra so uh, uh, every polynomial uh, p of z is equal to uh, you know uh, a0 plus a1z plus plus etc an z power n an not equal to 0 ai complex numbers has exactly n zeros in c counted with multiplicities So this is the fundamental theorem of algebra and the way one proves it is uh, 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 you know it is it is just using Rauch's theorem I will tell you uh, first in words very uh, it can be very elegantly expressed in words. So what you can do is you can get rid of this uh, you know uh, or do not get rid of it I mean you look at this polynomial you know as you make mod z uh, bigger and bigger then the modulus of this polynomial will be will depend on the leading term okay. So in other words uh, if you make mod z bigger and bigger that means if you make mod z greater than say a large positive real number r okay that means you are looking at the exterior of uh, a circle centered at the origin radius capital R for r large you are looking at the ex exterior and this is called uh, a neighborhood of infinity if you want okay if you think of <coughs> uh, the complex numbers as sitting inside the Riemann sphere with the point at infinity on the north pole okay this exterior of the circle is a neighborhood of infinity okay and what happens is that for when you go in uh, uh, for mods that are greater than capital R are sufficiently large then uh, you see except for the leading term all the other terms 
they become very small okay in modulus the leading term will dominate all the other terms in modulus okay. So you know uh, so what it tells you you th you look at only this function you take a such a large r okay and look at only this function okay and think of the rest of the terms as a perturbation it is a perturbation because the modulus of the rest of the terms is going to be very small when compared to the modulus of this because this is a leading term and you have taken mod z equal to r for r very large. So what is uh, what is Roche's theorem going to tell you it is going to tell you that the number of zeros inside mod z equal to r okay that is in the di disc mod z less than r is going to be uh, uh, for this whole function is going to be the same as the number of zeros of this big function which is a n z power n but a n z power n has n zeros a n z power n has automatically n zeros at the origin it is uh, z equal to 0 is 0 of order n. So Roche's theorem will immediately tell you that this polynomial will have n zeros and they all can be found in uh, inside a disc of sufficiently large radius. So it is a beautiful uh, I mean you get fundamental theorem of algebra just like that by, by thinking of the leading term as you know the big function and the rest of the terms as the little function and choosing the uh, yeah, disc uh, centered at the origin with very large radius okay how large as large so that the uh, modulus of the leading term dominates the modulus of the other terms some of the other terms okay. So this tells you how powerful Roche's theorem is okay. So <coughs> probably I will stop here and we will continue in the next lecture.